Welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, the ALA student chapter. Uh, we had so many registered tonight, uh, nearly 200. I know not everyone will turn up, but looks like we're having a good showing so far. So again, welcome to our tour. We did this once last year, it was a great success. So we started, uh, we had the idea of doing it again. And this year, uh, we are focusing on mobile libraries around the world. We custom designed t-shirts for the tour and we got special funding from uh, SGSU Associate Students. Uh, we received $750 uh, that we had hoped would cover free t-shirts for everyone, but given the sheer numbers of people who have registered and who are attending tonight, we won't have funds that are going to cover shirts for everybody. And there are a couple of options that we've been discussing. Uh, one of those is to seek funding elsewhere. So that is, the, that is what I'm going to be pursuing after our meeting tonight. The other thing that we could do is we could use our funds to actually subsidize, subsidize the cost of the t-shirts. So that is again, something I'm going to explore and I'll definitely share that with you. We are, as I said, we focused on mobile libraries for this tour. And this is just a small selection of archival photos of early uh, mobile libraries in the United States. Uh, mobile libraries have a long history spanning at least 100 years. And according to some source, the first one dates back to 1905 in Maryland. Uh, this bookmobile offered its service to readers who would otherwise have no access to books mostly the young and the elderly. And that is uh, the theme for tonight with mobile libraries is that the main focus is they're giving access and oftentimes they're uh, serving populations that may not have access otherwise. Forwarding to uh, the present and COVID-19, uh, librarians are still coming up with new ways to offer mobile library services with the innovative use of technologies. A school librarian in Virginia came up with the idea of using a drone to deliver library books to students who were homebound due to the pandemic. And here is our world map. We will be starting tonight in Antarctica and circling the globe. Uh, I have a poll that I'd like to share. And this, and asking which of the continents have you visited? And while you're doing that, I want to introduce uh, our team tonight. Uh, I'm Kelly Roisman. I'm the events coordinator, and I'm going to be your tour director. Uh, we also have Irene Miller with us tonight. She is my co-events coordinator. Uh, Claire Heisentrite, who's our events assistant, with Caitlin Greenwood. Uh, there still was one person, I don't know if you want to type in chat or whatever, tell us a little more about, about your um, experience in Antarctica. So I'm going to stop sharing and let's move on into our first stop on our tour. So we cheated a little on this one because uh, the little free library at the South Pole isn't strictly speaking mobile. Uh, but this library brings the illusion of warmth to the South Pole. There is no sunlight there for six months of the year, and temperatures can drop to minus 125 degrees Fahrenheit during the Antarctic winter. The library was established by Dr. Russell Schnell. He is an atmospheric scientist who was the co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for his work on the International Panel on Climate Change. According to Dr. Schnell, uh, books with photos of colorful trees, warm deserts, water, beaches, wheat fields, and animals and birds are popular at the South Pole. Everything else is white for hundreds of miles in all directions. So now we're ready to go to our next destination in Australia. Would you like to take that away, Claire? 
Sure. New South Wales was the first mobile in this top picture started serving the northern suburbs of Sydney in 1947. Uh, the bookmobile was converted from a Royal Australian Air Force mobile workshop and was stocked with 1,200 adult books and 1,200 children's books, serving 900 registered borrowers at the time. Now, the region's libraries use converted, fully air-conditioned semi-trailers to serve the local communities. The two pictured here, the Riverina Regional Library, which is the top right one, has the highest collection of turnover rate. This trailer serves 138,500 residents across 50 square kilometer, 50,000 square kilometers. The city of Ipswich, which is in the bottom left, uh, has lent for then 3.5 million items and served over 1 million people also offering a children's reading area and internet access. Great, thank you. And moving on north to Papua New Guinea. Uh, the Kam Kamuti, I hope I said that right, mobile library. Papua New Guinea got its first mobile library earlier this year. The bus will meet children in the community, stopping at schools and parks and other popular locations. The name of this library is what makes it special Library staff decided to name the bus after the longest serving staff member, Mr. Francis Kamudi, who started working for the library back in 1976. He's a jack of all trades, opening the building, sorting mail and cleaning. Naming the country's first mobile library after Mr. Kamudi is such a fitting tribute to the man who has played a modest yet vital role in keeping the library functioning for the past 45 years. Thanks, Irene. Yeah, I really like that one. I think it's interesting that they chose to honor someone who was actually in a humble position as the cleaner for all of that time. So let's go now. We're going to go northeast to the Philippines. So Lac Bay Ataklan Library on Wheels. Two years ago, a bus company in the Philippines transformed one of its old buses into a library on wheels to promote reading among children. The Lac Bay Aklatan, sorry, that's a tricky one for me to say, mobile library brings books to, pub, to public schools that are located in small secluded communities called barangays, which lack access to a library. According to one of the founders, the aim is not just to, for children to read for a while and then have the bus drive away. It's actually a very focused reading program where we have teachers who will do one-on-one -on -one tutorials with the kids. With the more in intimate and focused setup of our library bus, children struggling in reading have been quick to learn and grow. Thank you. And... I'm trying to get my geography right, but I believe we're going directly uh, to the west, to Laos. Laos has the Elephant Mobile Library. So what has big floppy ears, a long trunk, and a collection of books? The Elephant Mobile Library in Laos. When you combine saving an endangered species with supporting literacy in rural communities, you get a pachyderm pleaser. Room to Read Laos developed a program that supports literacy and overcomes the issues of, of delivery in remote areas of Laos with a very exciting solution. A visit from the Elephant Mobile Library includes literacy games and storytelling circles in addition to books for the kids. Oh, thanks, Irene. So now we're going, <laughs> I'm looking at the map, we're going north to China. So the Joy of Reading Mobile Library started as a converted truck in 2011 and was upgraded to a bus with lower emissions and more space in 2020. In the past 10 years, this mobile library has visited over 80 schools and reached 70,000 children in different parts of China. It primarily serves migrant children in urban areas where their parents have uh, left rural areas to come to work. 
In many cities, such children are un unable to attend public schools. The poor private schools seldom have access to a library. Funds for the mobile library come from the Cone Centennial Foundation, a global nonprofit that supports learning and cultural activities for children throughout the world. Thanks, Claire. And we have had our elephant library. Uh, we're going to move north to Central Asia to Mongolia. Yes, introducing our Camelback Library. Dash Dong Da Jamba, a book publisher and translator, has traveled over 50,000 miles throughout Mongolia, bringing books to children in this vast but sparsely populated country. His wife and son help him in his journeys to bring books to remote villages via camel, horses, ox carts, and motorized vehicles. Often, Jamba himself translates the books from other languages to make them accessible to Mongolian children. Thanks, Irene. I'm going to go back and just um, take a pause for a moment. And I was asking our um, tour, uh, tour guides how many countries we visited. And just sharing, Irene has visited Canada, Mexico, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and the Czech Republic. Uh, Irene, I have a question for you. Uh, did okay. you visit a library in each of those countries? Did you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm ashamed to say that I didn't. I did actually visit the military library on base in Germany when I was visiting my sister, but uh, other than that, no, I haven't. But new goals now. Yeah, that's what I would say with now that we're uh, aspiring librarians, we I would definitely uh, pick libraries to visit. Uh, so then I, uh, Claire, um, I have, you were the most traveled of our team and you shared with me that you visited 12 countries. I'm posing the same question to you. Uh, did you visit libraries in those countries? Yeah, definitely. Uh, library tourism has become a fun part of my life. Um, I would say, uh, in this country, I've been to a couple of the presidential libraries, which is very cool, um, I, particularly the John F. Kennedy Library in Boston is really beautiful. Um, in Europe, I've been to, uh, my friend was working on her doctorate in Belgium, and so she and I went to a couple of different libraries in Belgium. Um, and then I actually went to school in Spain. And so I spent a lot of time in my library in um, Getafe, Spain, at the Universidad de uh, Carlos Tercero. Um, so yeah, I've been to a couple of different libraries. Um, I just went to the Central Library in New York. Uh, I mean, in LA, just before the pandemic hit. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Oh, well, great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Caitlin, I um, you've been to Mexico. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> uh, did you visit a library there? So um, I went to Salulita. I, I don't know if there's a library. I didn't go to a library there, but I did go to a local market book exchange where um, everyone was exchanging a book for book. Um, and I ended up with a with a book that was actually a murder mystery that was set in the town where I went on vacation with my family, so. Oh, that's awesome. Can you type that in, if you can, into the chat? I'd be really the, the curious. The book itself? Oh, if you know, remember it. Uh, yes, I, I can. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, so, all right, for myself, uh, I have visited eight countries. Uh, Australia, Japan, Canada, Russia, Netherlands, Czech Republic, France, and England. And I'm rather disappointed to say that I, I've only visited a library in Australia, a, a couple of different ones, a public library uh, in Sydney and an academic library in Melbourne. So definitely now when I <laughs> uh, think of being a tourist again, I'm going to include libraries in that. So let's go ahead and continue our tour. Uh, 
we are now uh, going, I'm not even, let's see, let me try to figure out which direction before we move. All right, so we're going southwest, mostly south, mostly west, a bit south to uh, Lahore, Pakistan. Yeah, and there we find the Brickshaw Library. The Rickshaw Library visits communities in Lahore, Pakistan to provide learning opportunities to children. According to the mobile librarian, communities visit, visits have sparked social and communication skills, making children friendlier and more cohesive. Asking more questions about the stories and discussing their own ideas about the world has invigorated their reading experiences. These visits have largely benefited girls who do not get permission to go far from the house without their elders or need to stay at home helping with household chores. One girl in the community said to the mobile librarian, I wait for this rickshaw to come every day all week as this is just comes outside my house and I can easily come to it learn to read new books and do fun activities with the stories like role-playing and prop making. If it wasn't coming to my house, I would never have gotten the permission to visit it and get the chance to see such interesting books with so many stories and colors in it. This is my favorite thing to do. And I get very sad when it rains and the visit is delayed. That's a really nice story. Um... Yeah, we, we really can't imagine here what it means to be in these communities where there is literally no other access to uh, books um, and literacy uh, opportunities. So let's move forward. And this is a good example of that in uh, Turkey. Okay, we're here in Çankaryare, <laughs> Turkey, with the Library of Thrownaway Books. Um, with a love of books, garbage collectors in Turkey started salvaging books in 2017 from the trash that would have ended up in a landfill. After seven months, they had enough books to create their own library in an old brick factory. And when news got out about their library, the community donated more books. Then the garbage collectors started a new project and converted a garbage truck into a mobile library that travels to areas without libraries to share their love of books with kids in areas without access to a library. As the saying goes, one man's trash is another man's treasure and garbage collectors in Turkey have truly taken that phrase to heart. Now we're going to Israel and visiting another interesting library. Yeah, the Mitzitzim Beach Library. In the summer, the Mitzitzim Beach Library in Tel Aviv brings free books to the people who crowd to the beach. Borrowing a book is a perfect way to spend a day on the sand, whatever your preference, poetry, romance, psychological thriller, mystery, and more. To meet the needs of tourists and Israelis, the library, off the library offers a wide variety of nearly 500 books for children and adults in multiple languages, including Hebrew, English, Arabic, French, and Russian. So now we are going to Nigeria. Yes, here we are at the iRead Mobile Library. This library on wheels began as, a, began as a dream. When Funi Ilori started her dream project, she carried books and baskets from home to home. Years later, she received a grant and now drives a brightly colored truck to neighborhoods in Lagos so she can share her passion for reading with children who have limited access to books. According to Elori, readers are leaders. We ask the children, I read, do you read? If we do not raise readers now, then we would be raising leaders without the know-how. Every citizen in Nigeria should have access to a library. Yes, thank you for that. And now we're going to stay in West Africa for the next country. Yeah, the, the lab and library on wheels, which is in Ghana. Two years ago, Young at Heart Ghana, an ag tech nonprofit organization, launched Lab and Library on Wheels, a project that addresses the absence of facilities and equipments needed for quality, practical, and effective STEAM education in science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. 
The project's goal is to ensure that no child is left behind in acquiring critical skills for this digital age and beyond. Lab and Library on Wheels offers a cost-effective wheelable facility which gives children in rural low-income communities access to digital tools, e-learning resources, practical kits, and books to enhance practical and hands-on skills. The mobile library even carries rechargeable lamps for students in communities with no access to electricity. Thank you, thank you for that. And our next stop is somewhere I know fairly well because I did live in Moscow, Russia for over three years. I did uh, ride the Metro in Moscow almost every single day. So at that time, I'm aging myself, but uh, there were no smartphones and there certainly weren't any uh, libraries on the Metro. So let's go ahead with that one. Yeah, this must be really interesting to try now. Books on the Metro. Uh, the Moscow Metro stations provide free access to a collection of ebooks for Metro riders who have a smartphone. Scanning a QR code grants Metro reader riders entry to a collection of 100 titles from such famous authors as Pushkin, Twain, Tolstoy, and Verne. This allows people to fill the empty commuting minutes and increases the chance that they will be so caught up in a book that they miss their stop. Mm. So not just taking a nap. I think I've missed my stop on the Moscow Metro. Um, they have a great system. I live in Los Angeles, so uh, I've lived in many different cities before coming to Los Angeles. And I do appreciate them so much more when living in a city where you truly do not walk in LA or you don't walk very far. Uh, I've lived in uh, Tokyo, in Melbourne, in Sydney, and in Moscow, not to mention Seattle, which is where I'm from, and have always enjoyed taking public transport to go everywhere. Um, but in LA, yeah, there's just <laughs> no way. <laughs> so, uh, Let's go on to our next European country. Yeah, this one's very cool. So the Epos book book in Norway is they have this unique floating library service, which launched in 1959 and catered to communities on remote islands for more than 60 years, as well as visitors along the fjords on the Norwegian coast. During its stops, cultural events for children, like author lectures, concerts, and puppet plays would be held on board the boat. Last year, Norwegian officials canceled this unique service. This move prompted an angry reaction from the public. Author Henning Bernsvag had this to say, this is so empty-minded and against all principles dear to me that I can hardly believe it. While the cities are teeming with cultural offerings and expensive cultural centers, children in rural areas are denied this boat, thanks to shameless politicians. Now, I would have to agree with that sentiment. And I also read about this library that at the same time that they're canceling this boat, they had created and just built this state-of-the-art, amazing architectural wonder of a library in Oslo. So that really is where the priorities um, lie for a lot of places is, and I see that in the States too, that the, um, the emphasis is on, you know, what's shiny and new and, you know, what's a uh, cultural scene in large cities and uh, rural areas get neglected and uh, children's uh, learning opportunities and adults also are can be severely uh, limited, um, not only uh, by the ac uh, lack of access to books, but by the digital divide. So this is uh, mobile libraries uh, are really important to um, giving access. So let's move on now. We are heading south. Um, to 
Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And I have visited Amsterdam. I'll just add my little <laughs> anecdote about that. I was uh, traveling from Australia to Russia and my layover was in Amsterdam. Uh, they were holding a special Rembrandt um, uh, museum exhibit and the lines were incredibly long, but I was determined that I was going to um, see this. And I had purchased new um, shoes, <laughs> um, Doc Martens, before going uh, on my trip. And they're heavy leather, and I made the mistake of wearing them this day that I was waiting in line for the first time. And I had massive blisters and I could barely hobble. However, I still made it in and saw all the amazing art. So that's my little story. That is that is dedication to the cause, Kelly. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is the, the Beeb bus, the expanding mobile library. Beeb bus is a truck container that travels from school to school offering 7,000 books and a reading room. The unusual design of the bus is a solution to the narrow streets in the Zahn villages it serves. A conventional design wasn't an option as it would take up too much space. So architect Jord Den Hollander designed a smart solution not, that not only solved a spatial challenge, but also makes the library a spectacular experience. The library is made of two rooms with one sliding over the other. The smaller and inner space is the more traditional library space with 7,000 books with a transparent ceiling. After the truck drives off, the second space, a reused shipping container, slides upwards and works as a spaceship that serves as a hangout with cushions to sit in and a crow's nest for children to read, go on the internet, or get a bird's eye view of the neighborhood. That is so cool. <laughs> I love that one. So we are going to we have one more stop in Europe, so let's go on to Athens, Greece. Yeah, the Echo Refugee Library is a UK charity founded in 2016, and it's based in Athens. Greece as a, uh, in Athens, Greece, <laughs> as a lending library for refugees fleeing to Europe. The multilingual lending library travels to different refugee camps to connect readers with books and other resources to help prepare refugees for life after resettlement. The focus is on making connections and building community. It adapts to each place the library visits according to the needs of different community groups. Sometimes they park for a quick half hour of loans and returns. Other times they run sessions for more than two hours, drinking tea, collecting books, chatting to friends, and running other activities. Thank you. Uh, we are leaving Europe now and heading for Iceland. Okay, in Iceland, we have the chief, and I'm not going to slaughter that name by trying to say it. <laughs> um, but the idea to run a bookmobile in Reykjavik dates back to 1955, the same year that the Volvo bus, which would eventually become the first bookmobile, came off the assembly line. A few years later, in 1972, a smaller bookmobile hit the road and was named Shorty. The older, bigger one was then named the chief. In their lifetimes, the two bookmobiles loaned more than 2 million books, and at its peak, the chief loaned 1,000 books per day, which is more than any of the Reykjavik City Library branches that they loan today. About 20 years ago, the chief was replaced by a new vehicle and sent to the Transportation Museum, where people can visit and reminisce about the good old days when it made the rounds in the city. Meanwhile, the new bookmobile is still on the road and now stops at 30 locations in Reykjavik. Thank you. I think uh, I, visiting Iceland is on my bucket list. I don't know if that's true for anyone else. Definitely mine as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it would be really cool. So now we're going from the cold to the warm in the Caribbean and visiting Haiti. 
Yeah, and BiblioTapTap, uh, which is a mobile library service that was named for the Haitian phrase for a shared taxi cab, a tap tap. It consists of three modified pickup trucks that make weekly stops, one for adult and one for children. The mobile librarians organize a wide variety of group activities, including public readings, debates, workshops, and so on. In Haiti, where the literacy rates hover around 80, excuse me, around 50%, the BiblioTapTap mobile libraries are some of the country's only avenues for promoting access to information. Many traditional library buildings have become inaccessible due to damage from the 2010 earthquake and other natural disasters since then, including hurricanes. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, Haiti has experienced such devastation um, repeatedly. And I imagine that this is one of the very few ways that children have access to any kind of books or uh, opportunities for uh, improving literacy. So again, these are vital. And now we're going to go a little bit further west to enjoy, uh, visit Columbia. Yes, here we have another animal mobile library, the Biblio Burro. Um, Luis Serrano was a Spanish teacher in rural La Gloria, Colombia. Concerned that his students had no access to books at home, he decided to do something about it. By adapting the paddle sacks of his two donkeys, Alpha and Beto, from carrying water to carrying books, Luis created a makeshift mobile library and set off to take his books to children who would otherwise not have access to reading materials. With that, the Biblio Burrow was born. According to Soriano, kids wise up when they pick up a book. Their surprise and imagination meet together. You see them starting to, to laugh by themselves just by seeing the book. Thank you. Yes, it's amazing. I mean, there. There are other uh, libraries uh, in the world that do use animals. Uh, there are a lot using camels, uh, not just uh, Mongolia, but also um, uh, I know countries in Africa like Ethiopia. Uh, yeah, so and you know, so camels, elephants, burrows, etc. Many, many different ways that uh, people who are really inspired and inspiring uh, find ways to um, give access to people who need, who need books. So we are going to stay in South America to visit, visit Argentina. Yeah, <laughs> here we have one of the more unique mobile libraries. The Arma de Instrucción Masiva, or the Weapon of Mass Instruction, was commissioned by 7UP in 2015 for World Book Day. Artist Raúl Lemesov converted an old 1979 Ford Falcon into what is called the Arma de Instrucción Masiva, the Weapon of Mass Instruction. Armed with books instead of artillery, he drives around Argentina handing out books to adults and children with the promise that they will read the book he gives them. The bookmobile can store about 900 books in and out of the vehicle. Le Messoff's motto for the project was peace through literature. I think that was one of the things that really struck me um, when we were doing research for this presentation is that there are a lot of uh, libraries who are organizing mobile services uh, from an institutional uh, point of view. Uh, but it's amazing to me just how many creative individuals have um, set out to you know, create these amazing, unique uh, experiences with libraries. So it's very cool to find this one. It's pretty dramatic. I imagine uh, seeing it drive by on the streets must be really interesting. 
So now we are going to Central America. Yes, to the Wonderment Mobile Library, a local community of children and teachers in Chimaltenango, Guatemala, wanted a way to serve other kids in the community. With the help of an organization called The Wonderment, they remodeled an old sheriff's bus into a mobile library in California that was then driven down to Guatemala. Children all around the world got to include their ideas that went into designing this mobile library. I, I when we were putting the images together uh, for this, I was just amazed by the creativity uh, it is an artwork in and of itself, uh, and really, truly a collaborative uh, endeavor involving, you know, kids and teens. So now we are going north and to our southern neighbor, Mexico. Yeah, the Biblioteca Movil in Mexico City, bringing art architecture and books to Mexico City in a converted Freightliner truck, Biblioteca Movil provides communities with access to 1,500 books about art and culture. The design of Biblioteca Movil allows it to become a cultural center, providing workshops and seminars, as well as activities for kids. Bringing contemporary art to people into public spaces through books, music, performance, rather than just keeping it in galleries and libraries is the inspiration for this bookmobile. Yeah, I think this, this shot is actually the interior. Um, it's a little hard to see. Uh, I can see the books above, but it really is a multi-purpose multi -purpose space. Uh, that can be created wherever the um, library travels. So that's really interesting because it is bringing, um, you know, cultural aspects of city life into uh, different areas. So now we are going to our northern neighbor, Canada. Yes, to Calgary with the story truck. And that great picture on the back of the, <laughs> the pigeon. Uh, Calgary Public Library in Canada now has five mobile libraries that bring books, movies, and other library services to their community. Their fleet of libraries on wheels also includes two story trucks that bring literacy activities to children, like the one inspired by the children's author Malone's pictured here. The staff share stories, songs, and rhymes with the children they serve. Uh, Karen Quest has uh, typed something that's important into the chat, and this is, uh, uh, they actually have a, a division of ALA, I believe it is, that is uh, about mobile libraries. I can't remember A-B-O-S, what the exact uh, uh, acronym stands for, but um, they, she has put a link to Facebook. And yeah, she mentions there are just so many different creative mobile libraries. So if you're interested, I highly recommend, thank you, yes, <laughs> Association of Bookmobiles and Outreach Services. So definitely uh, visit their Facebook uh, page or their site. They do have annual conferences. The uh, one they had uh, for 2021 was earlier uh, in Aug October, just a, a several weeks ago. Um, so yes, that's definitely something really important and you can join, get involved and just, you know, learn interesting things by following them on Facebook. All right, so we have started at the South Pole and now we, as we come near the end of our journey, we are ending up at the North Pole. Yeah, in Fairbanks, uh, the North Star Burroughs Booksmobile. Uh, it's a, a little bit of cheating because the town of North Pole, Alaska is actually 1,700 miles south of the geomagnetic, geomagnetic North Pole. But um, it all began in 1952 with a real estate venture when a developer wanted to attract a toy company to the area. Now it's Christmas all year round. 
With a population of fewer than 20,000 or 2,000 people, North Pole is one of the small outlying communities served by the Fair Fairbanks NSB's mobile library service. The Bookmobile also runs a homebound program which delivers books to people who are unable to leave their homes. The Bookmobile also visits nursing homes, assisted living centers, and senior apartments, among others. Services are only canceled if road conditions become hazardous or if temperature drops to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit or more. So pretty cold. Yeah, but when I <laughs> hear that minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit, it's like, oh, that's not cold compared to the South Pole. I think it said minus 125. <laughs> Uh, which is just crazy. So we've started at the North Pole, or sorry, the South Pole, gone to the North Pole, and now we're going to return, at least virtually, because many of us are not there, to San Jose. Yes, to the San Jose uh, Public Library's Maker Spaceship. Our return trip takes us back to the future when in 2016, the San Jose Public Library debuted their Maker Spaceship. The bus holds a variety of high-tech equipment, including laser cutters, microscopes, and robots to encourage fun and exciting STEM education for all levels. During the pandemic, the bus sought out specific communities in San Jose in an effort to bridge the digital divide. They've been able to connect hundreds of community members to hotspots, library cards, and other resources to foster learning and fun. Okay. And that concludes, um, we go to our next slide. Um, I do uh, want to let you know, I hope you follow us on social media. If you go to our website, you'll find the links. Uh, so we do, yeah, we, then you will find out about our events and other activities on uh, later this month on November 18th, we are having a, spe a guest speaker and she's a public librarian and she's going to talk about innov sorry, innovative virtual programming. And then at the end of semester, we, we will um, again uh, collaborate with the other student groups in the iSchool and have an end of semester hangout. It's just an opportunity to get together very casually uh, to talk to fellow students. I always think this is really important that we can connect with each other outside courses. Uh, I know so much of the time we're just, you know, we're posting in discussion posts. And even when we have uh, team projects, it's still, it's important to, you know, feel like you're part of a community. I know probably when all of us were doing our undergraduate degrees, we're actually physically at a campus and uh, enjoyed the campus life. And since we don't have that as a 100% online school, uh, our chapter is really interested in uh, giving people opportunities just to connect with each other. And we know then that we're not alone. We're all in this together. We are actually a community, even if it's in virtual space. So I want to reiterate with the t-shirts, we custom designed this t-shirt. We're really proud of it. Uh, we want to give one to everyone possible that we can. Um, our funding, we receive $750, and that will cover a bit over 40 shirts. So we're really looking for more support. I'm going to explore that with the iSchool. Uh, can we find additional funds that we can just give everyone a free t-shirt, as we had hoped to do? Um, do uh, there are a couple options. Maybe we'll, you know, use the money to subsidize the cost of t-shirts. So uh, mailing costs are about $5 per shirt. So maybe uh, we'll have people, you know, pay for the $5 for the mailing. But my real hope is that we are able to find another budget there. But please, please monitor your email. I will be sending out messages. I'm going to stay in communication to let you know exactly where we are with this. It may take some time because as I said, I'm going to be looking for another funding source. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate it. 
Uh, I know that Irene, Claire, and Caitlin and I have enjoyed the research that went into putting uh, the slides together, and we learned so much and so happy that we could share that with you.